The topic I was requested to speak about was any pastime of Krishna and some lesson. So that was a really easy assignment. It's just so immediately I thought of this story. This is, not, of course, Krishna not in Vrindavan. And it's Krishna not in Dwaraka either. It's Krishna in Mathura. The same um, places that Krishna performs his pastimes in this world, there are those same places in the Goloka Vrindavan. Vrindavan, Mathura, and Dwaraka. And the intimacy in Vrindavan is super excellent. Yet the intimacy with Krishna and his devotees outside of Vrindavan are also most wonderful. And the story with Muchakunda takes place, well, the exchange with Muchakunda takes place um, in Mathura or near Mathura. So it's chapter 51, and this will start with the lesson, and we'll circle back around to the lesson. When Gargamuni was young, he was a, excuse me, when Muchakunda was young, he had a, an opportunity to interact with Gargamuni. We know Gargamuni for being, for many things, but most outstanding perhaps is he, he did the horoscope, the birth ceremony, the name-giving ceremony for Krishna and Balaram. He did that because it was known that he was a super astrologer and uh, had a deep sense of vision of everything. He was very, very, a very valued member of the Yadu dynasty. And because um, Nanda Maharaj was part of the Yadu dynasty, he wasn't in Mathura, in the ruling place. He was in the agricultural place. There's some history of how that came about. Pitter patter. A herd of elephants upstairs. Okay. Um, he, Gargamuni, Muchukunda was not in the same line. Muchakunda was in the Surya dynasty and the Vrishnis were in the Chandra dynasty. But because he was a king, he had the opportunity to have Gargamuni read his horoscope. And by association with Gargamuni, he received the seed of Bhakti. In the horoscope reading, Muchakunda was told the day will come when you will see the personality of Godhead face to face. And from that seed of bhakti, plus whatever of the other things that they said in relation to the personality of Godhead, he had become very convinced because of his faith in Gargamuni that day will come. So he was living his day and day by day with the anticipation when will that day come that I'll have the opportunity to see face to face the personality of Godhead? That was his, his spiritual meditation, along with all of the other things that he did. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's this teaching the root cause of devotional service to Lord Krishna is association with advanced devotees. Even when one's dormant love for Krishna awakens, association with devotees is still most essential. 
the seed comes from, like with every one of us, the seed comes from one who is carrying bhakti, and it awakens. Now specifically, sadhu sangha, advanced to devotees, those who are actually absorbed in devotional life. And Garkamuni was such a person. It'd be nice to elaborate on how that was so, but he received it. And his, his thoughts were always with Krishna, although he had never seen him. I mean, that happens sometimes. We're not so elevated. We hear about Krishna and we do so many other things mindlessly. But Rukmini, oh, she just heard about Krishna. She heard about Krishna. We've heard about Krishna. She heard about Krishna from Narada. And that was it. She gave her everything to Krishna just from hearing. There's other per so many other personalities just by hearing about the Supreme Lord. So, Muchakunda was a very advanced person spiritually. And he was uh, you know, materially also very, very qualified. We'll hear. Uh, the scene, I want to describe a little bit. The scene of, of Krishna and Muchakunda meeting comes at the end of Krishna's stay in Mathura. Does anybody here know how many years Krishna remained in Mathura? I researched and I asked a lot of scholarly devotees and I couldn't get a clear answer. But it, it appears that it was around 25 years, which is a long time because Consider how much we know about Krishna's childhood pastimes. We know a lot about Krishna's childhood pastimes. And we know how we also know from our acharyas how long he remained in Vrindavan. Very, very clear. Eleven years, seven months. And then when he was at of that age, that's when Akura took him to Mathura. And things in Mathura started to happen. He received his Upanayana from Gargamuni at the same age that um, boys in Chatriya families commonly receive their sacred thread. He was 11. And then he went to Sandipani Muni school for two months. He learned everything, came back. And then he did many other things. He went again as he promised he would. He met with Akura. There's a whole chapter describing that. There's a whole chapter describing his interaction with Vakubja because he promised to satisfy her. But that, that's just a short period of time. In the course of this exchange, there were 17 attacks by Jarasandha with massive armies. So it seems that it's around 25 years, those 17 attacks by Jarasandha. It's connected to Muchakunda because attack number 18 was coming from another place too. Simultaneous attack, Kalyavana. So let's go back and the relationship between Jarasandha and Jarasandha's enmity towards Krishna. Um, the enmity toward Krishna began when Krishna killed Kamsa because Kamsa had two daughters and these two daughters named were Asti and Prapti and when Krishna killed Jarasandha, when Krishna killed Kamsa, um, the daughters now were without a husband. They went back and said, Daddy, take revenge. So he took a vow that he would not only kill Krishna, he would annihilate the entire Yadu dynasty. And Jarasandha was very powerful. Here's a little history of how not only his two daughters became Kamsa's wives, but how Kuvalyapita came in the custody or the care of Kamsa. 
It's very interesting history. Simultaneously, so no, this means Kamsa was a little younger because the daughters were married to Kamsa and Jarasandha was a little older. But they were both powerful, very, very powerful Kshatriyas. They were on tour. Jarasandha was on tour conquering here and there. In the course of his conquering, he had this massive, gigantic, bigger than many elephants together, Kuvalyapita. And Kuvalyapita, in the evening time, they had him chained with all four legs and big spikes in the ground so that he couldn't get away. And then the next day they would take him here and there. Simultaneously, simultaneously, there was, uh, Kamsa was also touring. In Garga Samhita, there's a, th no thank you. In Garga Samhita, there's a very detailed description of Kamsa's exploits of how he gathered together so many other kings. And it's in Gopal Champu also. He would go doing combat with powerful kings, annihilate their army and leave them standing and give them the choice. You either submit to me or I'll kill you. That was his program. And many people submitted. Sometimes people fought him. But, so he had powerful, powerful kings. He was very powerful. All those people that were his assistants, that they were sent to kill Krishna, they were powerful, mystical warriors. So, on one occasion, um, Kuvalyapita broke loose. He pulled those chains and the stakes in the ground and went running. And he went running to a place where Kamsa was performing some meditation. And Kovalyapita interrupted his meditation. So Kamsa bashed him and bashed him and smashed him and picked him up and whirled him around and threw him hundreds of miles or many miles, some number of miles. Yojanas came crashing down in Jarasandha's camp. And Jarasandha said, wow, that was really good. Whoever did that, let's find out who's, who flipped Kuvalyapita in the air and threw him at such a distance. So he went in the direction from which Kuvalyapita was flying and he found Kamsa. And he said, let's be allies. You please marry my daughter and you keep as a gift Kuvalyapita. He's in your care and my daughters are in your care. So they made a friendship instead of fighting each other. It's one or the other. So Kovalyapita was then in Kamsa's care, as were his daughters, Jarasandha's daughters. And Kovalyapita was sometimes used in battle and so many things. Very, very big, very, very powerful. So when Akura was sent to bring Krishna to have him killed, in Mathura, one of the plans was Kovalyapita would be the first to try to crush him. And there's, I learned something last two weeks. There's a, when it, an elephant is in the, the stage of his, of the year where a male elephant is mad for mating, there's a material, a substance, that oozes from the, both sides of their temples. It's called mada. It means mad. That's one of the meanings. But it's a, um, a sap or some kind of liquidy, liquidy thing that spreads down the side of their temple, left side and right side. It's in, it mentioned specifically in one of Rupa Goswami's Padyavali prayers at the very beginning. And uh, he was, he was in, the, the English phrase is he was in rut. 
he was in this mating moods and that's when he that's when krishna came and so they the elephant trainers sent him charging at krishna of course balaram was also there and there's details and details of the, of the battle that took place there's many nice paintings you'll see some of them iskan paintings and he tried to trample Krishna and he, Krishna grabbed him by the trunk and threw him to the ground. And he then he got up and tried to charge Krishna again. Krishna threw him to the ground again and broke off his tusk and smashed him over the head with the tusk. Here it shows Balaram with the other tusk, but Krishna smashed him. And Kovalyapita was finished. And after Kovalyapita was finished, then Krishna went together with Balaram, carrying over one shoulder, Balaram over his shoulder, the two tusks of Kuvalyapita, bloodied on one end. And they went into the wrestling arena, and there was a big wrestling match between Chandra and Mushtaka and Krishna and Balaram. And the back side, you see on the left, that's the three brothers of Chandra and Mushtaka. Looking up on the upper right side, that's Kamsa, who is very interested in seeing Krishna being defeated by his two powerful, powerful, powerful wrestlers. But we know who won. And um, there's the three brothers hollering, the people in the audience in the back. And beads of perspiration coming down the side of his had Krishna finished him. The three brothers came onto the stage and Krishna and Balaram finished them. And that left Kamsa. And a nice description. Krishna was glancing at Kamsa like a lusty boy. He really wanted to finish Kamsa. So he jumped up on the via dais or the seat the throne grabbed him by the hair dragged him off the throne smashed him with one punch this powerful powerful ruler that was defeating powerful other rulers and kings and generals one punch krishna finished him look over there is balaram nonchalantly <laughs> enjoying the fun some of their cowherd boyfriends enjoying the fun and Kamsa not enjoying the fun but in the liberation of Kamsa um, Krishna wanted to demonstrate to everybody that he wasn't just like knocked out but he was dead so Krishna grabbed him by the hair and dragged him here and there and everyone is celebrating Wicked Kamsa's dead. And then what did Krishna do? He went and freed his mother and father from the prison of Kamsa. They embraced him, many nice exchanges. He saw to the um, re establishing on the throne King Ugrasena. There we see Krishna and Balaram on the left. And Apparently Gargamuni, although Gargamuni was probably much, much older than this, giving, putting the crown upon his head and the, the ceremonies were rendered. Gugrasen is now the king. Meanwhile, the two, the two sisters went back and told their father what happened. If it continues, you know what to do, right? Okay. So, who's Jarasanda, anyways? Jarasanda, there's a nice history, interesting history. There was a king, king of Magadha, who was Jarasanda's father, because he was the king of Magadha. Brihadrath had no children, and so he very much wanted to have a son. And so he married the two daughters of the king of Kashi. But after some time, there was no children. 
So he went into the forest. He met a rishi, Chandra Koshika Rishi, and made an appeal to the rishi to help him make some arrangements so he could have a son. Brihadrath gave him a mango, one, and said, give this mango to your co-wives and they will, be will bear a child. Well, he gave the mango to his co-wives so that they would bear a child and sure enough, they bore half a child each. And um, the, the, the king didn't know what to do. So he took the two halves of the two children that were born, or the child that was born, and placed them in the forest. And lo and behold, a she-demon named Jara found the two halves. And she was ready to eat them. But she decided instead, let me put them together and see what happens. And she put them together and it was a normal child. She was very surprised. So she found out that they were the two halves of the sons, the son of Rihadrath, and requested the king to raise the child, but to name the child after her. So he was very happy and gave the name Jara Sandha. The two halves put together making Jara Sandha. And that's the method by which Jara Sandha was defeated. You know the story. The big battle with Bhima and days and, and it went on non-stop and Krishna took a piece of twig and split it in two. Bhima understood, split him in two, so he split him in two. And Jarasandha was finished. But before Jarasandha was finished, he had these two daughters, Asti and Prapti, and when they were married to Kamsa, they became widows, and they wanted revenge. So J Jayadrath, excuse me, Jay Jarasandha took his oath that he would take revenge. And the, the Bhagavatam describes he gathered together 13 Akshohini divisions of soldiers. So what's an Akshohini? It's in the commentary by Aracharyas. Here's one, one Akshohini, one of 13. 21,870 chariots, 21,870 elephants, 109, 350 infantry, I don't know how those numbers are figured out, and 65,610 cavalry men on horses. So a lot of people on foot, a lot of people on horses, a lot of people on elephants, a lot of them on chariots, and off he went with 13 of those to have a big battle to destroy the entire Yanu dynasty and Krishna in particular. So it was a big challenge. So what did Krishna do? He, he, he laughed. He said, you can just stay inside the palace walls. I'll go out and take care of this myself. And sure enough, just riding on his chariot, every single soldier finished by... Krishna and his powerful bow and arrows except for one person Jarasandha standing alone at a battlefield strewn with dead bodies 13 Akshohini divisions of soldiers and smiled and said you can go home now <laughs> so when he was going home he was feeling defeated and, you know, for one who has once been honored, dishonor is worse than death, right? So he was thinking, I should give up my life. I've been humiliated by one man who I was going to go and smash. But when he got back to his uh, kingdom, Magadha, the ministers persuaded him, no, 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 it's just one of those things. 
you weren't ready, and da 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 da. You're, you're so powerful. Who can stop you? Gather another army and go back and try again. Yes, I'm going to go back. I was caught by surprise. And so he gathered another more than 13 Akshuhinis the next time. And off he went for a big, big battle. And each time, the same thing happened. Krishna thought, this is really a good plan. I came into this world to annihilate all the miscreants. And he's bringing them to me. It's a nice program. So he carried on for a number of years, something like 25 years, and 17 times. Same thing happened, and he sent him home. You can go home now. So something happened on the 18th time. And the 18th time, that doesn't say specifically how it came to his attention, but in, um, in the North Country, somewhere probably in the region of, of Afghanistan or someplace like that, there was another king, Kaliavana. And Kaliavana, um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes the history of Kaliavana. Want to hear the history of Kaliavana? I'd like to tell you. It's nice. Gargamuni had a son. He had more than one son, but he had one of his sons. Because one of his sons was a, a priest of Nanda Maharaj. But there was another son named Gargya, the son of Gargamuni. And in, um, in Mathura, his son was ridiculed by the Yadavas. Uh, they were ridiculing him as a eunuch. And he took big offense. They were laughing at him and, as far as he was concerned, vilifying him. So he became furious. So he went to the southern part of India and he underwent severe austerities. What was the severe austerities? For 12 years... His only food was the powder of iron. Yummy, huh? I mean, sawdust would be better. Powder of iron for 12 years every day. Lord Shiva became very pleased and appeared before him and said, what would you like? So he asked for a son that would bring terror to the Yadavas. Didn't say kill them. And uh, so he, he, the, the arrangement was Gargya, given that benediction by Shiva, later was called by a Yavana king who also had no son. And he requested, because he heard about this. Um, benediction of Lord Shiva, he asked Gargya to produce a son in his queen. So Gargya was the father. Kaliavana's father was, uh, doesn't give his name, the, 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 um, produced the son. And uh, after some time, as Kaliavana grew stronger and stronger and more mature, he could find nobody who was a co combatant sufficient to make it a worthy challenge for him. Who would visit his kingdom, the Avana kingdom, but Narada Muni. Narada Muni did some funny things. So he visited the Avana kingdom. And the Yavana king, Kaliavana, uh, asked who is a suitable candidate for me? Who is, the, who is the most powerful warrior on the face of earth? And he said that in the Yadu dynasty, they're the most powerful warriors. So, he immediately set off to go attack Mathura. 
Now the benediction given by Lord Shiva was met. He didn't say someone who a son who would kill Krishna. He wanted a son who would bring difficulty. Um, and Lord, Lord Shiva gave a benediction that would fulfill his desire, but also fulfill the purpose of Krishna, which was the deliverance of Muchakunda, which is our chapter 51 topic. So, from the east, from Magadha, that's where the direction towards Matra, where Jarasandha was coming, and Kalyavana was coming from the north. And Kalyavana had um, many, many, many. It doesn't give the number. Oh yeah, three million. Three million. That's a lot of soldiers. That's much bigger than all those Akshuhinis. Three million Yavana soldiers. And Yavanas are powerful warriors. So here's Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Oh, that's, I just narrated all of this to you. Vishnu Purana gives this account. The Garga Samhita gives the same account. Here's Brihat Bhagavatamrita describing this. Because Gargya and others were inimical to the Yadavas and the Pandavas, who were staunch Vaishnavas. Lord Shiva rewarded their worship with imperfect boons. According to Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, Gargya Balaki was a learned son of Garga, who was too proud of his acquired knowledge. By Lord Shiva's blessings, Gargya obtained a son, but not one who would destroy the Yadu dynasty as Gargya had wanted, but only one who would frighten and frustrate the Yadus. So this is the time when from the north comes Kalyavan and from the east comes Jarasandha with their massive armies. So Krishna turned to Balaram and said, I'm concerned about the members of the Yadu dynasty for their safety. There may be some harm that will come to them. So you stay here and hold them off. And I'm going to make an arrangement for all the Yadu dynasty members to go to another place. I'm going to take them to Dwarka. So he had he did it really fast. The whole city of Dwarka was built. He transferred everybody to their residential quarters in Dwarka, settled them, and came back. Doesn't say how long it took, but it was really fast. Dwarka was massive, massive. But Krishna's powers are without limit, right? And he came back. And when he came back, he was moving about the battlefield on foot. And Kalyavana, had, he hadn't seen Krishna, just like Muchakunda hadn't seen Krishna, but he heard about Krishna. And when he saw him walking or running across the battlefield, he said, that must be him. And so he started running after him. And you know what Krishna did, right? Krishna ran not too fast, just enough to be out of the reach of <laughs> Kalyavana. Just enough. And Kalyavana was hurling insults. Stop! You coward! Krishna would look over his shoulder and run a little faster. And Kalyavana run a little faster. And Krishna run a little... So they went some distance to a place where Muchakunda was in a cave. Now why was Muchakunda in a cave? Many of you know the answer. But it's a, it's a very nice description. Muchakunda... Although he was a resident of earth, he was so powerful that something like what happened with Dasarath, he was, who was sometimes invited to assist the demigods in battles against the demons. Kalyavan was such a powerful, excuse me, Muchakunda was such a powerful warrior that he was engaged in battle to help the demigods prevail over the demons. And it was fighting day and night for a long time. Finally, Kartikeya came. So they said, okay, Kartikeya can take the lead of the military. 
we're so indebted to you. Just tell us what, whatever the benediction is that you would like, and it's yours. And he said, I just want to sleep. I'm really tired. And if anybody wakes me while I'm sleeping, uh, they'll burn into fire. Bur my fire will come from my eyes and they'll burn immediately into ashes. The commentary says he asked for that because he didn't want the demigods to come and bother him again. He was really tired. And so he went to this cave. Now where's that cave? Does anybody know where that cave is? Dina Bandu, everybody that's been around for a while knows who Dina Bandu is. It's, it's in Rajasthan. Some distance, not too far, not too close, but some distance. So Krishna ran and ran and ran to this cave. It's a celebrated place. I don't have, I have photographs of the place, but it's not in this presentation. And um, Krishna went inside the cave. And when Kalyavana when chasing Krishna inside the cave, he thought, he's afraid of me, because I'm this powerful Kalyavana. When he went inside the cave, he saw someone sleeping. He thought, he's, a, he's tired out. He's lying on the cave, sleeping. So he went and kicked him. But it wasn't Krishna. It was Muchakunda, because he was sleeping. And Muchakunda had this benediction, that if, when somebody wakes me, from my eyes will come fire, and instantly the body of that person that wakes me will die. So, Kalyavada was a pile of ashes. Powerful, invincible Kalyavana. As you see in the painting, there's the inside of the cave, and in the back, there's Krishna. And... Uh, do you have Srimad Bhagavatam here? Does anybody, do you have a copy of Canto 10, Chapter 51? Yes? Maybe? It's where? Okay, find it. I want to read, from, I, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking ahead. I, I want to read, there's some passages. Here's another BBT painting, because you can see What? You, uh, I can hear ten voices, just you. Okay, but uh, no, don't, 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 stop. I'd rather have the book, but, but let's, well, wait till we get, if he comes back in time with the book, that's great. If not, we'll do the database. You have it on the phone. You got it. Can you bring it over? Bless your heart. But I have to tell you what verse. Okay. Um, here's text starting with text 36. 10, 51, 36. Okay. Bye. 36. Oh, 30, 36. Okay. So there we see this nice BBT painting. On the left side, that's Krishna. Notice he has four arms because he's in Mathura. With the symbols of Vishnu in his hand. There's Kalyavana being burned by the, the fire coming from... Thank you very much. Okay coming from Muchakunda's eyes. And here's a little description of Muchakunda's qualification. In commentary, it's described, he was very devoted to supporting brahmanas. He was true to his vow. He was very selfless. He gave up his unrivaled kingdom and his personal desires to fight along with the demigods. He was known as being very wise and he was very humble. And he had this benediction that he would see Krishna. And sure enough, he saw Krishna. Now, how does one become determined in 
devotional life. There's, there's something on the receiving end and there's something on the uh, desire end. So when you have association of el very elevated persons, you have the opportunity to become advanced. Which we, we also have so much opportunity. I was sharing just um, the other day this nice story, Prabhupada describing his humility, actually it was this afternoon, Prabhupada's humility was that he was not qualified. Because one who is qualified feels not qualified, which sounds like a contradiction, but it's, it's natural. It's a natural kind of humility. So Prabhupada was, this is one morning in Henry Street Temple. Prabhupada was saying in a humble way, I was loitering in a dark place and my spiritual master found me. And he forced my eyes open with the torchlight of knowledge. And he made me fortunate. He, he was, his voice was choking as he was describing this. He was very moved. And then my spiritual master told me, As I have made you fortunate, you go forward and make others fortunate. His voice was choking. And so I have come. Jai Prabhupada. And I met all of you. And you were loitering in some dark place. And I've given you knowledge. And I've made your lives fortunate. Jai Prabhupada. And now I'm giving you the same instruction. Receive this good fortune. Go forward and make others fortunate. The room just went nuts. The, you know, the drums beating and people jump bouncing off the walls and ceiling. And There was an instruction. Just like Prabhupada would give the instruction. Go to the western countries. And how long did he carry that? And, and what difficulty, what obstacles were there for him to fulfill that? Whew. Read the Lamrita and you'll, you'll know what those obstacles were. You got it. Nice going. This better than this. Could I have chapter 51, text 36? The, the, the request was to tell a pastime of Krishna with some lesson. So I'm repeating the lesson. The lesson is... Um, yeah, thank you. No, leave it, leave it, just in case. Just in case. Seek association of a pure devotee. And in case you don't know who is one, Srila Prabhupada is one. And he makes himself available in his books. So read his books and you'll get Sadhu Sangha just by reading Prabhupada's books. And if you're not yet reading them, please read them. And if you have them in your home, make sure you read them. And you can do it in, in how, any which way you like. Reading groups is very popular and... But read them and discuss them in the association of other devotees. And you'll, you'll receive the same benediction. At least the opportunity, if your heart is open and enthusiastic, to reach the goal. The potency is there, coming from Prabhupada's books. And that's what this story, the lesson this story is narrating. Um... Gargamuni indicated that when you meet Krishna, you will achieve the fulfillment and purpose of life, because only Krishna can give that perfection. Krishna gives liberation. So, there's the, another painting. There's Kaliyavana getting cindered. And um, there's an exchange between the two. Kaliyavana, uh, Kunda wants to know, who, who are you? Because he sees this effulgent personality situated in the cave. And there's the pile of ashes that used to be Kalyavana. Who are you? Here's Krishna's response. My dear friend, I've taken thousands of births 
lived thousands of lives and accepted thousands of names. In fact, my births, activities, and names are limitless. And thus, even I cannot count them. After many lifetimes, someone might count the dust particles on the earth, but no one can ever finish counting my qualities, activities, names, and births. O King, the greatest sages enumerate my births and activities, which take place throughout the three phases of time, but never do they reach an end to them. Nevertheless, O friend, I will tell you about my current birth, name, and activities. Kindly hear. Some time ago, Lord Brahma requested me to protect religious principles and destroy the demons who are burdening the earth. Thus, I descended in the Yadu dynasty, in the home of Anakundundubi, which is a name of Vasudev. Anakundundubi means he was perfectly virtuous. There were, so as he was born, there were sounds of trumpets and mu musical instruments, Anakundundubi. Indeed, because I am the son of Vasudev, people call me Vasudev. I have killed Kalanemi, reborn as Kamsa, as well as Pralamba and other enemies of the pious. And now, O king, this barbarian has been burnt to ashes by your piercing glance. Since in the past you repeatedly prayed to me, I have personally come to this cave to show you mercy, for I am affectionately inclined to my devotees. What a beautiful way to reveal who he is. Now, choose some benedictions, plural, from me, O saintly king. First it was O friend. Now it's O saintly king. I will fulfill all your desires. One who is, has satisfied me need never again lament. So here's the exchange as they're introducing one another. Of course, Krishna knows who Muchukunda is. And Muchukunda, now the light goes on. This is that person who Gargamuni said, one day I will see, and by seeing him, I will achieve perfection. So here's his response. I'm going to go advance a little bit. After their discussion, uh, Krishna says some key things. He says to Gargam, he says to Muchukunda, I, there's some service for you in your next lifetime. For this lifetime, in your role as king, you killed many animals. You have to be, undergo some austerity to purify yourself for having killed those animals in the course of hunting and for, you know, qualifying yourself as a king. So you, you go do that. And in your next life, you'll become an elevated person. You'll assist me in my pastimes, and then you'll go back to Godhead. It doesn't say what that service was. It's like a little detour, but that's another chapter of <laughs> Krishna's pastimes. So, Muchukunda wanted to know who was standing before him. Krishna responded. Now, Muchukunda is going to offer some very beautiful prayers, which I'm going to read. And especially, it's, it's the starting point is humility. When good fortune comes your way, it helps to recognize with some regret how, how I've misused my life up to this point. Bhaktivinoda Thakur calls this a kind of tapa for a Vaishnav. Back there, it's not just impure reminiscence, it's regret. I lived, I was like Naratam Das Thakur. I lived my life knowingly drinking poison, 
neglecting the worship of Radha Krishna. That's Narottam's words. Let's hear what Mukunda, which Mukunda's words are. Mujukunda bowed down to the Lord when he heard this. Remembering the words of the sage Garga, he joyfully recognized Krishna as the Supreme Lord Narayana. The king then addressed him as follows. She, Mujukunda said, O Lord, the people of this world, both men and women, are bewildered by your illusory energy. Unaware of their benefit, they do not worship you, but instead seek happiness by entangling themselves in family affairs which are actually sources of misery. That person has an impure mind who, despite having somehow or other automatically obtained the rare and highly evolved human form of life does not worship your lotus feet like an animal that has fallen into a blind well such a person has fallen into the darkness of a material home humility expressions of humility and regret i have wasted all this time o unconquerable one becoming more and more intoxicated by my domain and opulence as an earthly king, misidentifying the mortal body as the self, becoming attached to children, wives, treasury and land, I suffered endless anxiety. With deep arrogance I took myself to be the body, which is a material object like a pot or a wall, thinking myself a god among men. I traveled the earth surrounding, surrounded by my charioteers, elephants, cavalry, foot soldiers, and generals, disregarding you in my deluding pride. A man obsessed with thoughts of what he thinks he needs to be done, intensely greedy, and delighting in sense enjoyment, is suddenly confronted by you who are ever alert, like a hungry snake licking its fangs before a mouse, you appear before him as death. That body that at first rides high on fierce elephants and chariots adorned with gold, as known by the name King, is later by your invincible power of time called feces. Worms or ashes. Having conquered the entire circle of directions and being thus free of conflict, a man sits on a splendid throne receiving praise from leaders who were once his equals. But when he enters the woman's chambers where, he, where sex pleasure is found, he is led around like a pet animal, O oh Lord a king who desires even greater power than he already has, strictly performs his duties, carefully practicing austerity and foregoing sense enjoyment, but he who, whose urges are so rampant thinking, I am independent and supreme, cannot attain happiness. When the material life of a wandering soul has ceased, O Chuta, he may attain the association of your devotees. And when he associates with them, there awakens in him devotion unto you, who are the goal of the devotees and the Lord of all causes and their effects. My Lord, I think you have shown me mercy since my attachment to my kingdom has spontaneously ceased. Such freedom is prayed for by saintly rulers of vast empires who desire to enter the forest for a life of solitude. O oh, all-powerful one, I desire no other boon than service at your lotus feet. Because remember that he's responding to the question. 
Please take benedictions. Anything you want, your desires will be fulfilled. What are they? Blank check. So there, there are no longer those other ones. And there's only this one. Oh, Hari. What enlightened person who worships you, the giver of liberation, would choose a boon that causes his own bondage? Therefore, I put aside all objects of material desire which are bound to the modes of passion, ignorance, and goodness. I am approaching you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for shelter. You are not covered by mundane designations. Rather, you are the Supreme Absolute Truth, full in pure knowledge and transcendental to the material modes. He goes on. So what does Krishna say to that? <coughs> this is one of those verses. This verse that, w that we just recited is from that section of his prayers. And there is a detail. It's found in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya chapter 22. This is Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Sanatana Goswami. It's a celebrated section, the prayers of one who has received the mercy of a devotee to have the mercy of Krishna come into their life. The, the, it, it's a... The, the cause and effect are in, in reverse order. And it's, it's a particular... Um, Literary ornament. Alankara is a, means a literary ornament. And some, so sometimes when a, a, a consonant is repeated again and again and again in a line of poetry, that's a, a certain type of literary ornament, alliteration. Anyway, this is a type of literary ornament where something, for sake of emphasis, the cause and effect are reversed. For sake of emphasis. So listen with that understanding. He's so enthusiastic in the way that Vyasadeva has composed this, or Shukadeva Goswami has narrated it, the, the order is reversed. When the material life of a wandering soul has ceased, but how does material life of a wandering soul cease? It comes from the association of a sadhu. Oh, Achyuta, he may attain the association of your devotees. And when he associates with them, there awakens in him devotion unto you. That part is the natural. So here's the explanation found in Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's, it's an apparent inversion of sequence. And it's an ornament, or a lankara, for uh, emphasis of how wonderful it is, the association of devotees. The association of Garga, Muni, was so wonderful that my bhakti awakened and I was always praying to you. May that day come when I will be able to see you. And now, by your mercy, you've come. And now my material desires are gone. The merciful association of the Lord's devotees makes possible our determination to become Krishna conscious. So, the conclusion of this long chapter is uh, Krishna responds, basically saying, I was just testing you. I knew what your response would be, but I, was, I wanted to examine. And this happens sometimes. It happens sometimes from very elevated persons. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in Antilila chapter 4, he's examining or testing Sanatana Goswami. He knows the heart of Sanatana Goswami, but he's examining the heart of Sanatana Goswami and amplifying by his own internal potency. He's amplifying the absolute, total dependence of Sanatana Goswami on Lord Chaitanya's mercy. 
and then he cures his disease, which was the source of that anxiety that he had. Not because he was afraid of illness, he was afraid of making offense. Anyway, in that same chapter, it's an important lesson, so I'll say it again. In that same chapter, where Sanatan Goswami comes to Jagannath Puri, it's ten days after Rupa Goswami left Jagannath Puri. Ten days. And Rupa Goswami had come to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Puri with his brother, Anupam. Right? They were the third brother, Rupa Sanatan and Anupam. When Rupa Goswami was traveling to meet Lord Chaitanya along the, the river Ganges, Anupam died. So he gave that report to Lord Chaitanya when he came to Puri. And then Rupa Goswami stayed for 10 months. He left. 10 days later, Sanatana Goswami comes and Lord Chaitanya gave him the bad news. Your brother Anupam has left this world. And then Sanatan Goswami reveals that Rupa and I tested him. Tested him in the sense that he was a, he was a Rambhakta. Anupam was a Rambhakta. And they were trying to encourage him, Anupam, to become a Krishna Bhakta. They tested him. But he couldn't give up. He couldn't give up. And they praised him. Just see, you're such a ardent Ram Bhakta. And they were respecting his Ram Bhakti while he was respecting their Krishna Bhakti. And there wasn't like a competition or rivalry or something like that. But they examined him. And Lord Chaitanya examined Sanatana Goswami. And here Krishna is examining Mishukunda. It happens. Examining doesn't mean like I want to find out where you're at. We discussed that a little bit today when Nathji was examining Prabhupada. Some of you may know that, that, that Your Ever Well Wisher was a documentary about Prabhupada that Yadubar had made some years ago. And in that there's this interview with Sri Nathji. Sri Nathji was like, he's now deceased, but he was a, you know, very successful businessman. And when he met Prabhupada, he examined him, like he said in this interview, but as a businessman, it's, it's, it's our tendency to want to see where's the weakness of somebody. So I wanted to see. Maybe he's, maybe he's greedy, maybe he wants money, maybe this, maybe that. And I tested him every which way. And I found him to be a perfect person. He had no weakness. So Krishna seeing this Murchakunda have a weakness. But he, Krishna knew. So let's hear what Krishna says. It's really, really nice. If you have the opportunity to meet Krishna, be nice if you can be appreciated by Krishna like this. Oh, Emperor, great ruler, your mind is pure and potent. Though I enticed you with benedictions, your mind was not overcome by material desires. Understand that I enticed you with benedictions just to prove that you would not be deceived. Prahlad, same. Nishringa Chaturdasi is coming. The intelligence of my unalloyed devotees is never diverted by material blessings. The minds of non-devotees who engage in such practices as pranayama are not fully cleansed of material desires. Thus, O King, material desires are again seen to arise in their minds. Wander this, so here's this parting words. Wander this earth at will with your mind fixed on me. May you always possess such unfailing devotion for me. Because you followed the principles of a chatriya, you killed living beings while hunting and performing other duties. You must vanquish the sins thus incurred by carefully executing penances while remaining surrendered to me. O King, in your very next life, 
you will become an excellent brahmana, the greatest well-wisher of all creatures, and certainly will come to me. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you for finding the book somehow. So there's, in life, there's tests. Now, if, if you're um, not a devotee, there's also tests. But it, you know, the purpose is different and the outcome is different. And for the devotee, there, um, Krishna's in, in examining. He tested the gopis, didn't he? He left the gopis. And then he, he, he hid behind trees to see what were they going to do. I mean, of course, he's omniscient, but it was a, a pastime. And later, he tested Rukmini. I think I'm not qualified. You made a mistake. You shouldn't have married me. And you're better off having a more qualified person than me. Look, at I'm just a village person. And she fainted. And he said, oh, your love is so pure. He wanted to experience that exchange with her. There's this saying that the Krishna will never put us into a difficulty beyond which we can handle. Now, it may be a stretch for us to handle, but the idea, the understanding is Krishna is there. The, the support of Krishna is there. It's right in um, the, the story of Bali Maharaj. He was put in a very severe situation. Prabhupada's comment is, Krishna will, will, may do like that, put you in a difficult situation or test your... Do you have material shelters or only spiritual shelter? And if it's in an extreme situation, Krishna will give you all the strength. He'll do, make the test, but also give all the strength and all the intelligence to meet the test. Like what Prabhupada did. Of course, it takes very strong devotion. But when there's strong devotion, and, and you want it to become stronger, then there may be some purification, some circumstance that's a little uncomfortable, or really uncomfortable. It happens. It happens. It doesn't mean, like Prabhupada, he was gored by a cow. Short, just after he had taken sannyas, one of the first things that happened, the, the horns of a cow pierced his body. It was a difficulty. And he had no, no assistant, someone to take care of him. And, you know, so pure devotee, put into difficulty, etc., etc., etc. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur comments that when that shelter, intensif intensified shelter, is taken in Krishna, Krishna gives one intelligence how to handle the situation, what the next move should be. He, he, his support is there. And when feels that connection with Krishna, that's what we want. It doesn't have to be an ordeal type of connection, but any kind of connection. So, Muchukonda was setting a nice example for us. The Supreme Lord said, O Emperor, great ruler, your mind is pure and potent. We read this. Though I enticed you with benedictions, your mind was not overcome by material desires. Here's Krishna's testing Rukmini. Celebrated chapter that's coming up later in the 10th canto. Krishna and Dwarka. It's nice to talk about Krishna's pastimes. Like the world just stops and it's absorbing in thoughts of Krishna and his wonderful exchanges with his devotees. So let's see. Ramchandra, are you standing? Is there something you'd like me to do? Oh, you're, he's going to pass the mic. If you have some comments or questions, you can please... We have a microphone over here, too. Ah, it's on. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the wonderful class. <coughs> 
Maharaj do we know who Muchakunda was in his next life where he became an no, accomplished I, I've searched okay. a Brahmana a pure Brahmana okay. doesn't give his name doesn't give what he did that's a, like I said that's another chapter that's not published in the 18,000 verses of the Bhagavatam thank you Maharaj okay Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Maharaj, in our professional lives and um, even just what we do on a daily basis, we have a really big doership mentality or I have a really big doership mentality. I think it just comes in very like um, like nonchalantly. Like you can think about it, you're always in like, I'm doing, I'm doing that and I don't do it like the world. And... Um, Maharaj, and sometimes when we're in that mood, Krishna really... You really have the one who's helping you do all of this. So how do we um, intentionally or like explicitly propagate the dependence of Krishna part while being independently thoughtful like Srila Prabhupada said? She knows the answer. My answer for how to questions is following the, the footsteps of Jai Dwaita Swami. Two words. Sadhu Sangha. I mean I heard I was saying that, then I heard he was saying that. So I think I'm I'm happy to follow in his footsteps. You you associate with persons who have this you know, this this verse that was quoted from Chaitanya Charitamrita, association with advanced devotees. Then association with advanced devotees means, here's an example of what it, what it means to be acting in the world, but w without false ego. And it's not only I can read, it, read about it in a textbook, but I can see it. I can see it. Here it is, live. And then from the mouth of such person comes the same messages that I read about or hear about here and there and think about here and there. But then when it comes from the mouth of such persons, it's, it's, it carries me to that, you know, beyond the limitations of my false ego, limiting influences. In short, yeah. Bhakti has the power to dissolve false ego and there isn't something else. This is Kapila's teaching. Bhakti has the power to dissolve false ego and there isn't something else. So how do you get bhakti? By associating with bhaktas and doing bhakti activities in their association. And it, it, does it take time? Yes. Why does it take time? Because we're attached. Does it have to take time? No. But it does. Because we're attached. You know, so let go. Well, it's not so easy to let go. I mean, I can let go of some things, but some other things I hold on to. Okay. You hold on to some things and then you suffer, right? So you're attached to suffering, right? No, I'm not attached to suffering. But I'm attached to things. The joying spirit. I'm attached to it, and they're, they're my, I have my favorite enjoyments. And so, take some time. <coughs> Follow the bhakti process nicely, starting with hearing and chanting with, with <coughs> great attention, with faith in that sound vibration, in the association of sadhus, and Bhakti will become stronger, and as bhakti becomes stronger, false ego becomes weakened. Read Madhurya Kandamani chapter 8, and you'll find the same thing described there. Ramchandra, you had something. <coughs> Prabhupada said about preaching and everybody went off the roof and excited. And, uh, make others fortunate, he was his words. Right. I've come to make you fortunate, now you go forward and make others fortunate. And everybody got so excited. So, in the
face there and see how can you get the same kind of a video? And it's going to have to say, go ahead now, do this. Well, it, there are persons, younger generation persons, that have that enthusiasm. And there's some that don't. And some that are, you know, they're, they're comfortable. So it, it requires the, the, the understanding, I'd, I'd like to reply by saying, we respect anyone who's carrying bhakti. Anyone. We respect souls that, we respect souls that, are in material bodies that aren't even in human form. We respect life. We respect, so this is Sanatana Goswami's teaching. Then you go up the ladder. Then there's living entities in a human form. There's living entities in the human form that this and that become Vaishnavas. And then there's Vaishnavas that are they go further and further. So we have special re reverence for those very elevated Vaishnavas. And we have the opportunity, honestly, we have the same opportunity by reading Prabhupada's books and hearing his recorded, it's the same thing. Same thing. It's, it's his association. So what, what's, what's, is our receiver on or mixed? So, we, we seek out advanced association. And when you ha if you have that desire to make spiritual progress. Now, something happens in spiritual life. We start with a, str a very sincere, strong desire. And we advance rapidly. And then as we advance rapidly, commonly, what will happen is that using Bhakti Thakur's words, that enthusiasm becomes cold. Or we become complacent. My my <laughs> unhappiness has diminished. My the four kinds of pious people, those wants have now been fulfilled, and it's now see you later, Krishna. Thank you very much. I'm very busy now being successful. Until that so it, the unsteadiness of bhakti is is part of our experience. And Recognizing that and reading about it, seek the association of those who are very advanced. And there are some very advanced, younger generation, per very advanced persons. They may not have a, you know, a title or bells and whistles, but they're very advanced persons. We seek their association wherever and serve them. And, we, and, and um, I'll just a little sharing with you, with you and with everybody. For about six months, there was something, something that started the ball rolling, but I became very involved in the lives of the six Goswamis. And at least three times, in three di to three different audiences, one including the devotees in China, I went through like at least a 30-hour each time in-depth uh, appreciation of the lives of the six Goswamis. And I can tell you that had a very strong impact on me, spiritualizing, revitalizing, rejuvenating, invigorating my sense of being close to Lord Chaitanya because that's near the doorway to get Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And our whole life as Vaishnavas is looking up to pre predecessor acharyas, we find it in the, the, the song, the writings, etc. They're, they're all doing that. Appealing for the mercy. Even if, with contemporaries or generations before them. The opportunity is there. If there is, when there is opportunity for someone who's available to us by physical proximity and we can directly be in their association and service, that's wonderful. But then the same invigoration is certainly possible this other way, through sound. And becoming intimately connected with those personalities. Does somebody know how to...
tell children to go to a different place nicely and Is that all right? Yes, there's a hand up front here. Yeah, I see your hand, but he's going to bring you the microphone. So, Maharaj Mukunda. Mukunda. Yes, in his uh, addressing, I mean, prayers in Lord Krishna, he says, uh, Lord Krishna, the, he addresses Lord Krishna as Narayan. You are the yes. personal. Yes, so, in uh, Hare Krishna, as we see, the, uh, Krishna is the supreme personality. Correct. And uh, all other avatars comes from the Krishna. Yeah. So how come he, he says... Why not? Narayan. Because... I mean, Krishna he, himself was there. Yes, because Krishna is the source of everything, and Narayan is not different than Krishna, so he's Narayan. He's not wrong. Here, Krishna, the painting show... Not, not this one. Here it shows Krishna with two arms, but the painting show him with four arms. With the symbols of Vishnu. Or the symbols of Narayan in his hands. He's Narayan. Lord Brahma, in Canto 10, Chapter 14, also addresses Krishna as Narayan. Because he is. Because he's a source of Narayan. And it's really nice. You can read in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Krishna doesn't say it in the Bhagavatam, but Krishna's consideration is, Lord Brahma, please consider what you're saying. I'm just a little boy. And you're the original personality in the universe. And you're calling me your father. I'm a little boy. I'm seven years old. Actually, at this time, he was five years old. Five years old. I'm your father? Brahma, consider. And then he says, then Brahma says, yes, you're my father. Here's why. Because you're Narayana. And Narayana is my father. Narayana, one of the names, one of the applications of the name Narayana is Garbhadakshay Vishnu. And it said, so you can read in Chaitanya, if you like the philosophy it's very sweetly expressed by Krishna Das Kaviraj in three different ways. In compelling different arguments, Brahma says, yes, you are Narayan. You are my father. Although you're taking the feature of a five-year-old boy. So it, it's philosophically correct. It's not incorrect. His feature is he's Vasudev, the son of Vasudev. But you know, another name is Krishna. He's all the time. Another name is Narayana. He's the shelter of all living beings. That's the, one of the meanings of Narayana. Ayana. Narayana. He's the shelter of all living beings. He's Narayana. But you, 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 you like. It's, it's juicy. It's a joyful, juicy exchange between Brahma and Krishna found in Chaitanya Charitamrita where he gives his three compelling reasons why Krishna is Narayan, my father. Nice. You, I invite you, please read it. Anyone else? Okay, I think we'll end with this. You have something? Yeah, okay. Maharaj, I think I asked this question like five years ago or so, but um, it's about faith, Maharaj. It's just like, um, especially if you're a little bit older in age and you've seen the material world, you see that there's so many, you know, religious groups and spiritual groups and there it's very natural to have confusion when you like stumble upon ISKCON and you're like, okay, is this just, you know, another one of those? So when you first start practicing bhakti, how do you sort of tell yourself that or how do you feel that this is it? Mm. 
many, I'll comment. Many people join the Hare Krishna movement with their mind. And not necessarily with understanding why, why they're doing what they're doing. And when that happens, it's uh, the soft and pliable faith situation. Something else comes along and something else comes along and they're, they're scratching their head. Uh, a, a better method is a, a, big, a, a, a big factor in someone's becoming connected with the process of bhakti is sadhu sangha. And it's not just the teaching, because they may not have thoroughly read Bhagavad Gita yet. It's the, the character and quality of the Vaishnav. Vaishnav uh, Achar. Vaishnav behavior, Vaishnav quality. And that it's consistent. It, it's, um, it's a fact. I mean, we may like prasadam and, and things, you know, like some other things. But it's the sadhu sangha that makes um, the difference. And then gradually uh, becoming more familiar through the sadhu sangha method with what the, the teachings actually are. And then that, that initial faith can become more firm and realized. I mean, the, the question you're asking is, 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 is a, I know a devotee, Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj was writing a book on this topic. I mean, so it's a big topic. And at different stages, how does faith grow? You know, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur wrote another book about it, Madhurya Kandamani, the stages of Bhakti, and how does it grow? But in, in the initial phases, and what what is our responsibility when we're in when we're meeting new people? It's a exemplifying function of quality. And it that doesn't solidify the person in bhakti practice, but be a perambulatory Bhagavad Gita. Be a walking example of what Krishna's teaching in Bhagavad Gita is in terms of you know your speech and in terms of your um, how, yeah, how you conduct yourself strive to be of Vaishnava character and then you know it, as, as time passes such a person us or others will naturally in, in, carefully want to help the person understand XYZ but not in a dogmatic way, in a, in a very reasonable way, so people can then understand X, Y, Z, and then they have the they can start to have a foundation that's strong. And then when they come across something that's different than X, Y, Z, they, at least they can say, "Well, I have X, Y, Z." I'll give a little example, and it can end. <coughs> Some a few years ago. About 53 years ago, I was a college student. And I was uh, a product of the counterculture. I mean, soci sociology, sociologically speaking, I was in a, you know, a, a defiant s spirit. Kind of. Not completely, but... So I started reading Prabhupada's books. But I was also reading other books many other books and uh, I was gathering some questions and uh, there was one person who I wanted to go ask I had a whole sheet of paper with many questions and he, this devotee um, I won't mention his name but he is a very nice devotee uh, I, I went like several hours out of my way to you know to go visit this devotee and I went through the questions one by one by one but I had the like the what the the one, the stump, the Swami question, and the, you know, at the very end, and the stump, the Swami question at the very end was: I was reading a Sufi book, and in the Sufi book, it gives a very clear description of Krishna's form. So, I my question is: we you know, like why, 
this and why that, why not that instead of this? How is it that they were able to understand Krishna's form and put it in this book? And he was thoughtful and he gave a very honest answer. He said, I can't say how that was possible, but here's what I can say. I have all faith in Srila Prabhupada and by Srila Prabhupada's association and following his teachings, I'll come to know more about Krishna than any other way. And my, my pride was way up here and I felt like it just got punctured. And I wanted to crawl under a rug somewhere and just be ashamed of that, you know, the challenging, it wasn't so much in a challenging spirit, but it was, that was what was going on. So why this instead of that? So his character was what defeated me. Or convinced me. Compelled me to carry forward. Because I didn't have doubt in what Prabhupada was doing. And since saying, you know, there are things that Prabhupada said that was certainly challenging to my scientific mind. But that was okay. I don't, that's, that's fine. Challenges are good. It was the, the compelling was the so if we if, if if such a beginning person can contact a sadhu who has genuine qualities, genuine qualities, not the cosmetic kind, but the genuine kind, that's powerful. And stay in that you know, just keep keep seeking out that association, that particular person or persons who have those that kind of quality and character. Learn. Deep, more deeply about you know what the what the the, a, the the XYZ the foundation of bhakti life and you become strong the, the fa false ego will be dissipated and the spiritual sense of who you are becomes very strong unshakable eventually okay thank you very much Prabhupada Gita.